Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to our Facebook Live. The POA is an association that provides education and information to residential landlords throughout New Jersey, as well as leases and forms. And today, joining us, we have both Bruce Gooden and Derek Reed, who are partners in the law firm of Early Petriello Gooden and Plaza, located in Newark. Mr. Gooden is a frequent lecturer on the subjects such as landlord tenant law, residential and commercial evictions, as well as Section 8. He is co-author of the book, Landlord, Tenant, and Related Issues in the Superior Court of New Jersey, which is given to Superior Court judges as the bench manual in landlord tenant cases. Mr. Reed dedicates his practice to advising and representing housing providers in the state of New Jersey. He has extensive experience representing multifamily property owners, developers, and property management companies in all aspects of operations, including leasing and eviction. He is also an instructor with the Rupper School of Continuing Education and has lectured extensively on a wide range of real estate and housing law topics to numerous industry groups and associations. We have the pleasure of having both of these experts with us as we talk about landlord tenant rights during COVID-19. Bruce, do you wanna kick us off with an update on the status of the courts right now? Oh, sure, Kelly, happy to uh, participate. Thank you for inviting us to speak at the program. Well, the current status of the courts is, for the most part, unchanged. Right now, we're under, as everybody knows, a state of emergency in the state of New Jersey, probably countrywide, actually. Uh, but there's currently an order from uh, the Chief Justice of the state of New Jersey, Chief Justice uh, Stuart Rabner, and that order effectively suspends the calendars specifically with regard to landlord tenant cases through the end of this month. So that's May 31st. Today's May 27th. And we've not received any further notice or updates from the courts as far as when calendars will recommence. Uh, if I had to guess, I would say that uh, if Justice Rabner's order is not extended, in all reasonable likelihood, there are not going to be any calendars during the state of emergency, no calendar calls, which would effectively constitute a large public gathering in any of the states. Okay, so. So that's the like status, that's the status of the calendar calls as far as personal physical actual appearances in court for hearings. Nevertheless, the courts do remain open for filings. So that has not changed. So landlords are still permitted to file actions for repossession of rented premises in the courts. And we've been recommending to our clients and to landlords, property owners, property management companies that they should file their actions as soon as they ripen in order to get in the queue because we believe once the courts do reopen for in-person physical appearances, the cases that have been filed will be given preference in the order that they will receive. Can you discuss a little bit about people that were already in the queue prior to you know, the public health emergency? What I mean, I know you don't know for sure, but what the thought is about those cases? Sure. We have cases dating back to February this year that were filed, issued docket numbers, issued court dates, hearing dates for appearances towards the end of March. And as we know, uh, towards the middle or third week of March is when the pandemic really exploded. State of emergency was implemented uh, by Governor Murphy. No uh, large public gatherings could be held. Courthouse doors were effectively shuttered. Uh, those cases are in queue. What the courts were doing were sending us notices of adjourned court hearing dates, uh, which have come and gone. Now the notices that we are receiving is that court hearing dates are TBD, to be determined. Okay. They effectively, they don't know when they're going to reopen. Uh, it's just an unknown factor at this point. Okay. 
Um, are there any eviction cases at all being, being heard for, you know, it, not just non-payment of rent, but say, you know, cases where a landlord has been threatened by a tenant or the tenant has been dealing drugs or, or any of those cases being heard, heard virtually? You know, the, the theory was that cases that had to do with actions for repossession or, or premises or eviction based upon something other than non-payment of rent could be heard. It could be heard uh, virtually through a teleconference, a Zoom meeting, a Microsoft Shares type meeting. And the courts have actually tried to handle some mediations electronically. But I think just the sheer volume of cases that they're faced with <clears throat> and also dealing with a lot of litigants who are unrepresented uh, okay. makes it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to for the court to handle or hear cases remotely on an electronic basis. But there's no prescription or prohibition against evictions for cause based upon something other than non-payment of rent, but the reality is those cases are just simply not being heard. One of the carve-out provisions in Governor Murphy's Executive mm -hmm. Order Number 6 was that uh, cases that deal with something other than non-payment of rent uh, could proceed in the interest of justice and Several attorneys across the state have made applications to the courts to have their cases proceed in the interest of justice. We have just not yet seen any judge uh, approve one of those applications. Okay. What are your thoughts about when the, the courts do open up, what it's gonna look like? There's obviously gonna be a considerable amount of backlog that needs to be dealt with. Well, the courts are considering expanding the powers of special masters, essentially making attorneys, uh, giving attorneys who are employed by the courts some expanded authorizations to issue orders. The courts are considering breaking down the calendars to have several different calendar calls throughout the day, whereas ordinarily all court cases would be called or heard at 8.30 in the morning. Or nine o'clock or 11 o'clock or 30 in the afternoon instead they would put 25 cases on every 15 minutes something along those lines the courts are also considering night hours uh, Somerset county has a, a nighttime program to hear when their tenant matters just like many municipal courts throughout the state have night court and those are some of the options that the courts are considering now to deal with the backlog and obviously the, the most obvious one is to add more judges, which is always a problem for the judiciary is adding judges. Okay. And Kelly, right. uh, just to um, just jump back in on one of the questions you had about you know, some of the cases that were filed before the state of emergency, uh, before uh, various legislation was enacted. Some of the questions uh, that I've gotten from a lot of clients is, my property is subject to the CARES Act. We're a covered property under the CARES Act, which was enacted on March 27th. Uh, and as everyone knows, or may not know up to now, uh, that puts a moratorium on filing for non-payment of rent actions uh, from March 27th through June 24th, right? So you can't even file for non-payment of rent if you're a covered property under the CARES Act until June 24th. But one of the questions that I've gotten from a lot of folks uh, that own covered properties is what happens to all those cases we filed before the CARES Act was enacted? And HUD has come out with some guidelines and specifically addressed this question that any cases that were filed before the CARES Act was enacted on March 27th can continue. So as long as the courts are going to hear calendars, uh, those cases can move forward if they're already if they were already filed before the CARES Act was enacted. Another question that Bruce and I get a lot is, uh, whether you're a CARES Act property or not, what happened to all the warrants of removal that were filed before the public health emergency um, and haven't been executed yet? What happens with those? 
Um, and in our conversations with the court, uh, they're looking at it as those warrants of removal will be, the time will be told for the period of time that the moratorium from Executive Order 106 is in effect. Uh, as everyone knows, Executive Order 106 is a state order, uh, an order from Governor Murphy uh, putting a moratorium on lockouts for the public health emergency and for up to two months after the public health emergency. And so if you file the warrant of removal before the public health emergency, you should still be able to execute that warrant once um, the moratorium uh, of Executive Order 106 is over. Okay. Derek, while we have you, um, an unfortunate reality of COVID-19 is that owners are now having to deal with an increased number of tenants passing away. Um, how, how does an owner deal with such tragedy and, and what do they need to do legally? Well, uh, you know, it is an unfortunate reality. Uh, it's something that uh, my clients have seen more and more of during the public health emergency. You know, it's always a reality for housing providers that um, you know, you're going to have residents that pass away at the property. I mean, people pass away in their homes all the time. Uh, but we have seen an, an unfortunate increase in this uh, during the uh, public health emergency. And so setting aside you know, the personal uh, tragedy, uh, no one's discounting that, uh, the, the landlord, uh, the housing provider, has to deal with the situation. Um, in normal times, what would we do? We'd file a non-payment of rent case against the estate, move forward by taking back legal possession through the execution of a warrant of removal, and then sending a uh, abandoned property letter uh, to to the property and to the next of kin or whoever we can find. In the pandemic, that's just not practical um, because, as Bruce just talked about, you know, you you may not get possession of that property till late summer maybe even the fall. Um, and so that's just not a practical outcome. Uh, what I've been working with clients to do is put together an agreement with any next of kin or anyone that shows up uh, to, uh, to clear out the property. Typically, we wouldn't give anyone access to the property unless they were appointed as executor or have letters of administration. But unique times call for, I think, more creative ideas on this. And so what we've done is uh, worked with clients to put together agreements for these folks to sign some type of indemnity and hold harmless. Uh, not foolproof, but it's it's better than nothing uh, to take back legal possession of the apartment and to allow uh, these folks to clear out the decedent's belongings. Uh, another, another avenue uh, that some courts are allowing us to do, I know Mercer County and I've also had conversations with the clerks in Hudson County, is allowing us to file emergent applications uh, with a cover letter uh, explaining the scenario that you know, the, the moratorium on lockouts really is to protect the residents in the property. Uh, where we have a resident that passed away and we don't have anyone coming to claim uh, the estate, um, you know, we're, we're really left in a bind by uh, having to file for non-payment of rent. Uh, in order to expedite that process, uh, the courts have allowed us to uh, file on an emergent basis with cover letters uh, explaining that there is no resident in this property anymore, and that there's a that there's a an increased need to, to turn this unit over to get someone else in that is looking for housing, especially when you're talking about affordable housing uh, where there's waiting lists and things like that. It, it's really um, important that we take back possession and are able to get someone else in there. And again, it's not, there's no prejudice to the tenant uh, because there no longer is a tenant living in the property. So, you know, those are various considerations uh, that we've, uh, we've dealt with um, in this situation. And, um, you know, it's, it has to be evaluated on a case by case basis every time, but we're in unique times. And so we're trying to get more creative with how we can move forward. Uh, when unfortunately we have a resident pass away. A question that we often get um, outside of COVID when a resident passes away is, what do I do with their stuff if no one comes forward and claims it? 
how do I deal with that and make sure that if someone comes later, I've done what I legally was you know, responsible to do? How does a, a landlord deal with that? Well, it's a tough question uh, because, uh, you know, the abandoned property statute, I think, uh, really assumes that there's someone there to claim the belongings. Um, and how we've dealt with it is we take back legal possession of the property and then we serve an abandoned property notice. Uh, as you know, that's 33 days from the date of mailing to the last known address, uh, usually the address of the apartment. And if no one claims the belongings within 33 days, then a landlord has a right to sell the belongings uh, and use any uh, profits that they get from the sale of those belongings towards any un unpaid rent. Um, they can discard the belongings. So and that's, that's typically how we handle that. What I tell clients to do in that scenario, however, is make sure they take an inventory, make sure they take pictures of the belongings that are in the property to protect themselves from someone that comes maybe later on and, and says, you know, you threw out a million dollar coin collection. You know, there were, you know, five flat screen TVs in the property. So you want to document what was in there. Um, another way to handle it, is, especially if you have someone that is, uh, asking to recover those belongings is with the agreement that we talked about. If someone shows up and says, you know, I'd like to get the belongings out of the property, have them sign that agreement. Um, or, you know, a landlord could always under the, uh, always put the stuff in storage under the abandoned property statute. Um, you could put it in a storage facility, and if no one claims it, no one comes to pay the storage facility, the storage facility will auction the belongings away. Uh, so those are a couple ways to deal with that issue. Okay. In these Perfect. unique times, in these unique times, you I've also actually told some clients a somewhat unorthodox uh, methodology to proceed when there is a tenant who's passed away in a unit, or we find that unit abandoned, since we really have very limited to no access to the courts. I've actually consulted some clients to use self-help in these circumstances. Uh, especially in some of the inner cities where uh, units become abandoned, they become subject to break-ins, vagrants, homeless uh, people accessing vacant units. So I've actually counseled clients to use self-help, which is ordinarily frowned upon by the courts and by the law, but to use self-help to secure the premises, until such time as we can actually regain lawful possession of the space. Yeah, just to just to add to what uh, uh, Bruce just said, uh, the other part of that is for the belongings in the unit. If you are going to engage in that uh, type of self-help, um, again, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, and I think the the, the facts have to be evaluated. Uh, to see if that is something that makes sense, because uh, self-help is, as Bruce said, found upon, well, it's, it's not permitted by the law uh, in New Jersey. So, you know, in these unique times, if we're going to go that very extreme route, we want to look at the facts. And the second thing is, the belongings in the property you want to put in storage. Uh, we want to make sure that we at least care for those belongings for a certain period of time uh, in, in the event that someone comes to claim the belongings at the very least. Okay. Can we touch a little bit about, you know, rent increases during this time? This is another popular question we get a lot on Facebook as well as here in the office. Um, I know that certain you know, Union City, Jersey City, Newark have rent freezes right now, but a lot of landlords are asking about can an owner increase the rent during this time? What can they do about, you know, incremental increases? Well, the governor said effectively uh, when he announced executive order 106 that rent increases would be frowned upon what that really means is probably not much uh, but the only current restriction on rent increases in the state of new jersey is if the property is financed through the new jersey housing finance agency hmfa uh, if it's an nj hmfa project uh, they have restricted rent increases for the time being during the pandemic. 
during the state of new uh, emergency. Certain municipalities have jumped on the bandwagon, including Union City, Jersey City, and Newark. As far as we know, uh, they uh, passed or adopted ordinances or issued executive orders using rents and rent controlled properties only. Uh, those uh, executive orders coming out of the municipalities or ordinances are subject to challenge. A group of landlords in Union City have actually filed the lawsuit to challenge the enforceability of uh, their ordinance that they adopted, suspending rent increases on rent controlled properties. A temporary restraining order was denied by the courts, but that litigation is still pending. Uh, Newark passed on um, uh, just May 12th, so about just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Mayor Ross Barak put a moratorium on rent increases for two months following the end of the state of emergency. Uh, and that's retroactive to April 1st. So nobody's yet challenged that as far as we know. We believe it's subject to challenge. But sure, we're being asked a lot can rent increases be implemented. So one, two, or fifth or trick that we're suggesting to landlords if they're going to increase rents as they are permitted to do ordinarily, uh, usually at the expiration of a lease, uh, not more than once every 12 months is considered reasonable, but if a lease does expire or 12 months or more have passed, if a landlord intends to increase the rents, they can serve the notice of rent increase along with a coinciding notice that the uh, increase is going to be uh, just suspended until the pandemic is over effectively. This what way, our... once another 12 months passes, they can implement another rent increase. They're not missing the opportunity to impose a rent increase, but the collection of the increased amount is just suspended in the state of emergency. Okay. One of our uh, viewers has a question. Um, they served the notice to raise the rent on February 26th, pre-COVID, um, and it was going to be affected a effective April 1st. Um, can they continue going forward with that, or is it not acceptable? Was that, uh, Kelly, I didn't hear you. Was that someone living in Newark or someone that has a property in Newark? It does not say where the property is located. Well... I mean, if, if they're in Newark, let's just say, and they issued a rent increase that was to take effect on April 1st, um, the Newark order that Bruce referenced is retroactive to April 1st. And I've had several discussions with the rent control department in Newark as to how they are interpreting that order. And the way they look at it as of right now is that any rent increase given during that period of time, whether you collect it or not, is null and void because the way they're looking at it is the number is zero. Usually Newark, you can increase uh, rent control properties in Newark uh, in accordance with CPI. Okay. Um, the way that Newark is looking at it during the moratorium issued by uh, Mayor Brock as the executive order freezing rent increases is that it's zero during that period of time. So any rent increase notice that's served or that's to go into effect during the moratorium would be would be void. That may change. You know, like I said, I've had conversations with them, and um, I've actually voiced my concern for that interpretation. Um, you know, I would rather see it where we can serve the notice of increase and give a concession during the moratorium, so we can keep residents on the same uh, anniversary date. But um, as of right now, they haven't uh, they haven't ceded to that. Okay. Um, speaking of rents and assistance, I know, you know, most of our landlords understand that this is a pandemic and we need to try and work with tenants. Are there any assistance programs being offered um, that tenants can take advantage of or landlords can go ahead and make them aware of to help collect with rent? Well, sure. Uh, obviously, landlords are in the business of renting property for a profit. They need to have ten tenants who are customers in order to stay in business. Without customers, any business is doomed for failure. So, uh, 
ordinarily it's in the best interest of the landlords to try to work with their tenants in order to try to get the rent paid. While that's not usually the duty or obligation to be their brother's keeper, there are a host of charitable organizations uh, who do have some present funding available and on uh, our sister association's website, the New Jersey Apartment Association, they do have actually a link to uh, various organizations who can provide assistance to tenants that we know a lot of our landlords are sharing with their tenants. But ultimately, it's the tenant's obligation to pay the rent. Uh, certainly, we want to try to work with our tenants and turn into any sort of a payment arrangement if possible in order to keep them in possession of the premises so we don't have to turn the unit over. Uh, ordinarily, uh, there are not uh, waiting lists <laughs> handy for landlords to just uh, refill apartments, re re tenant apartments once they become vacant, but there's certainly a turnover cost involved that if it could be avoided, landlords like to avoid that to get the tenants help. Are there any towns that have individual rental assistance programs separate of nonprofits that you know of? Off the top of my head, I can't think of any towns that are offering tenants rent assistance. Derek, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, Newark uh, in particular has actually set aside a million dollars um, for uh, rental assistance. Um, I think they're still working out the mechanics as to how that's going to be distributed or how you're going to apply for that. Uh, but uh, Newark has designated a million dollars towards direct rental assistance for uh, residents that have suffered a financial hardship during COVID-19. How far a million dollars is going to go, you know, I don't know. Um, Bruce, I think you referenced um, Bill S-2332 in the state. Did you reference that, Bruce? No, I did not. Okay, so... Uh, there is a bill that uh, the New Jersey Apartment Association has really, really worked very, very hard on in promoting, um, and uh, they were instrumental in getting it passed by the State Senate and the State Assembly. And that would uh, create $100 million in rental assistance, $100 million in rental assistance uh, for tenants in need due to COVID-19. Uh, as I understand it, it's currently on the governor's desk. It's been on the governor's desk for over a week now. Um, I don't think anyone ever thought it would sit there that long um, because this is really, really uh, greatly needed assistance uh, for tenants and frankly for landlords as well. Um, and so if you visit the New Jersey Apartment Association website, they do have a link there uh, where you can uh, voice your uh, support for the bill uh, that would, uh, you know, hopefully push the governor to pick up his pen and, and sign it and get this really badly needed money to the folks that really need it. And we'll post that that information also in the comments once this is over, so that all the viewers can participate in that. Um, in addition to the to the late fees and the rent increases. Many owners are wondering when they can open up their amenities. Um, what is permitted at this time? What is not? And you know, when can we look to move forward to possibly being whole again at some point? Well, it's it's a fluid situation, Kelly. I mean, that's the reality. Um, as everyone knows, uh, we're in stage one of a five-stage reopening process, um, and so. No one really knows when stage two is going to happen. It depends on uh, the numbers as far as hospitalizations and infections. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the governor and his office are watching that pretty closely. So there's really no specific date that I can give you where, you know, we're going to be able to open up everything. But as we sit here right now, um, you know, owners have begun to at least think about opening up uh, some of the amenities that have been shuttered at their properties. As of right as of right now, I don't recommend it. I don't recommend opening just yet. We're still in a state of emergency, um, and so you know there is a, there is a risk with the, you know opening up your tennis courts and opening up your pools and certainly opening up your fitness centers, which have to be remain closed pursuant to uh, uh, 
the governor's order. Uh, but it's, it's good to start thinking about these things. And so, you know, you want to think about your leasing office. What's your leasing office going to look like uh, when it reopens? Um, you know, a lot of my clients have been doing virtual tours with residents. I think that's likely going to continue. Um, but, you know, having applicants come in the door into the leasing office and tour the property is, you know, one of the important, one of the important marketing things that, uh, that we do to sell our property. And so I think owners really need to think about social distancing. Uh, if anyone's been in the supermarket recently, you'll see the markers on the floor uh, to stay six feet apart uh, from everybody. Um, uh, obviously, PPP precautions, personal protective uh, masks and things of that nature. There's even been some housing providers that have gotten masks with their logos on it to, to look more professional, which I think is a really uh, cool idea. But... Um, you know, reducing your staff in your leasing office, restructuring your leasing office to make sure that everyone is socially distanced for those employees that are working there. I mean, the main thing is you want to make sure your staff, uh, the residents, and the prospective uh, residents are all safe. And you want to try to uh, impose policies that promote that. So, you know, you also have to think about, um, you know, the clubhouse and other areas at your property that you use for gatherings, you know, there's certain common areas. You know, right now, you can't have, uh, I think, inside a group of more than 10, outside a group of more than 25, but they all have to practice social distancing, which is still very hard to accomplish uh, in, in some of these amenity spaces. And so, you know, right now, it's probably a good idea to keep those closed. But when you think about reopening them, you want to think about uh, various uh, cleaning measures, various disinfecting measures that you can take, um, such as you know wiping down door handles, commonly touched spaces, um, to you know limit the risk of exposure uh, at those types of areas. Uh, certainly, fitness centers, physical activity centers at properties have to remain closed. Uh, those haven't been allowed to open at all um, in the state of New Jersey, and. With multifamily properties in particular, um, it's always a question of oversight, right? Because, you know, you have a gym with employees that work at the gym. They check people in, make sure that there's not too many people in the gym, make sure everyone's practicing social distancing, using PPP, uh, a PPE, um, also uh, cleaning the equipment. We don't have the same type of oversight and maintenance at fitness centers in multifamily properties. So that's also a consideration. When, when New Jersey does open up fitness centers uh, for multifamily properties, I think there's going to be another set of uh, considerations, and that is how do we oversee compliance with the, uh, the restrictions that are going to likely be imposed by the governor for reopening those types of things? How can we oversee um, the amount of people in there? How can we make sure that machines and, and various areas are cleaned and sanitized uh, more frequently, and and the same thing, you know, good a good uh, analogy to to that is what recently happened with tennis courts. Right? Um, initially, uh, tennis courts and municipalities were allowed to reopen. Fine, uh, you know, they enjoy some municipal um, immunity uh, for for lawsuits, and you know, municipalities go ahead and open up. Um, and then the governor came out with, I believe it's Executive Order 147 last week, saying certain recreational, outdoor recreational activities can reopen. And one of them was tennis clubs. But if you look at the restrictions that were put on the reopening of tennis clubs, the restrictions really aren't something that multifamily properties can comply with, similar to what I was talking about with fitness centers. Uh, the, the requirements for tennis clubs to open under Executive Order 147 is there has to be you know, so, uh, the, the people checking in, uh, the, uh, the folks at the tennis club have to make sure that you know, there's not too many people there, no more than 10 people on the courts at any time, um, social distancing, uh, frequent cleaning and, and sanitation um, of the facility. And, you know, those are the things that for tennis courts that are just in, you know, open and, and available to anyone at the property is going to be very difficult for housing providers to oversee and to make sure that those protocols are being complied with. 
So, you know, even with tennis courts at properties right now, I know a lot of owners have asked, a lot of housing providers have been asked by tenants, when are these going to reopen? But right now, um, as we sit here today in the public health emergency, um, it's, it's, it's not advisable to open those just yet. You know, Executive Order 147 doesn't really pertain to uh, tennis courts at multifamily properties. You know, swimming pools is another uh, question I get a lot. When can we open our swimming pool? Well, you know, the CDC has come out and said uh, it's extremely unlikely that the virus will be transmitted through the pool because of chlorine and, and the various uh, treatments to the water. So the real risk of the transmission of the virus isn't through the water. It's through uh, the interaction with other residents around the pool, on the pool deck. And so, you know, while it might not be advisable to open the pool at all this summer, given the current state of things, uh, if we do, if you do move that way to open the pool and you do allow residents uh, to the pool deck, it's extreme social distancing, again, cleaning and sanitation. And that brings up another question. How is that going to be monitored? How is that going to be um, overseen by the housing provider? And so, you know, is someone going to have to be assigned to make sure that those rules and policies are being followed? Um, you know, and there's likely going to have to be an amendment to your rules and policies, to the pools and these amenities that's going to have to be given to the residents to, to advise them of, you know, the, the new normal, at least for now, relative to the use of these um, amenities. Um, so, you know, those are some of the considerations with, with the amenities uh, that, you know, once we do get to a place where those start to reopen, you know, some of the things for housing providers to consider. Uh, another question I get a lot that's kind of related to uh, the opening up of amenities is, what about routine maintenance? What do we do about uh, servicing apartments for routine maintenance? You know, at the beginning of the public health emergency uh, and up till now, really, my advice has been to cease all routine maintenance um, in consideration of the health and safety of our maintenance staff and of the residents. Um, just there's no reason to do it unless it's an emergency. And if it's an emergency, there's certain questions that have to be asked to make sure that the people in the apartment haven't been exposed to COVID, haven't, haven't uh, taken care of someone that has COVID or, or has any symptoms of COVID. Uh, but, you know, if it, there's an emergency, we take certain precautions and we make the repair. Um, the question now is, when do we start doing the routine maintenance? And I think it's still a, a risk to do that at this point, uh, you know, to, to go in to change a light bulb in a unit, is, is that worth the risk of potentially, um, you know, having some cross-contamination of COVID or being exposed to COVID, either your maintenance staff or the resident? Probably not. Um, but, you know, it's really something that has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis by the housing provider at this time. I just still am not, I'm not in a place where I'm, I'm advising clients go in, start doing routine maintenance, you know, we're at a place now to do that. I mean, remember, even though parts of New Jersey are still opening, we here in this state are still in stage one of a five-stage reopening program, number one. Number two, we're still in a public health emergency. Whether or not that's extended uh, in early June or not, I don't know, uh, but we're still in a public health emergency. So we just want to be, I think, cautious before we start, you know, going in uh, apartments with regularity to take care of uh, routine maintenance. Um, so anyway, th those are some of the uh, some of the questions I've gotten about uh, reopening amenities and about, you know, uh, re resuming maintenance. And um, I think uh, those are some of the considerations that uh, I've advised clients to think of. So we want to take a couple of questions. We have some coming in over Facebook. Sure. All right. If a tenant was behind in their rent prior to the start of the pandemic and are now more than four months behind and have just vacated, um, how do we go after them for the balance due? That's very straightforward. It's a civil action for collection of any amounts due pursuant to the lease. If they vacated during the lease term, they remain obligated for the rent through the expiration of the lease. 
subject to a landlord's obligation to mitigate their damages by attempting to re-rent the premises in a commercially reasonable fashion uh, actually brings up another uh, idea or subject along those same lines. Uh, we have a client with a significant real estate portfolio where a lot of the leases have personal guarantors. And a client this week or last week asked if we can start lawsuits against the personal guarantors to pursue collection of the rents that haven't been paid by the tenants. And we said, of course, absolutely. There's no prohibition or restriction on filing an action for collection of any amounts due pursuant to a lease agreement or personal guarantee. You don't have to file an eviction case first before you file a collection action. So we have a landlord with a nice significant real estate portfolio pursuing all their tenants who have personal guarantors for collection actions. And the courts are accepting those filings, they're docketing those cases, and they will ultimately be issued court hearing dates. Okay. One of the one of the considerations, however, though, if if that collection action is going to be filed by someone who's defined as a debt collector, there is a bill, um, bill uh, Assembly Bill thirty nine zero eight, that does restrict uh, debt collectors filing collection actions during the state a public health emergency and for up to two months after the emergency, as I recall. It might be nine hundred and uh, might be 90 days. I have to look at the uh, the bill again, but there are some restrictions on on collection in New Jersey right now, based upon uh, that legislation. Okay. Um, we have another one. Um, a tenant gave me notice at the beginning of the month of May that he was vacating the property at the end of the month and wanted to apply the security deposit towards rent. I didn't oppose his request, but he does not answer my calls to confirm the date of move out. And there are only four days left to the month. What are my options? Can I enter his apartment June 1st and change the locks? Well, that's also pretty straightforward. Uh, there was executive order 128 issued by Governor Murphy uh, last month that said residents in New Jersey, residential tenants in New Jersey, have the absolute right to request that they, that their landlord apply any security deposit that's being held on their account to any rent that's due. It's not a landlord's option. It's completely the option of the tenant. So the tenant has the absolute right to apply their security deposit to their rent account. Uh, if a tenant tells you that they're leaving and you confirm that the unit is vacant, my opinion is that you can go in, secure the unit, and the place is yours. If a tenant tells you that they're leaving, but they have not vacated the unit, you cannot simply change the locks. So if you can confirm that that unit has effectively been vacated by the resident, then my opinion is that you have lawful possession of that unit back. Ultimately, the best evidence of the surrender of lawful possession of the premises back to a landlord in any circumstances is where a tenant returns the keys. The physical act of the routine of the keys constitutes an actual lawful surrender of the premises. But a tenant just notifying you that they're leaving does not mean you can simply change the lock. Okay. Are there any considerations for a buyer looking to own or occupy a two unit property if both units currently have tenants in them current, right now? Well, the, you can uh, evict one of those tenants. Uh, under subsection L of the Anti-Eviction Act, uh, that you have purchased a property and look to personally occupy it. Uh, there's a couple of considerations, though. One, you have to personally own the property. You can't own it in an LLC. An LLC can't personally occupy the unit. So um, the the individual who seeks to personally occupy has to have at least 5% ownership in their own name of the property. Uh, and then it's a two-calendar month notice. You have to serve a two-calendar month notice, meaning if you serve that notice today, it would terminate the tenancy on July 31st. And if that resident doesn't leave on July 31st, then you have to file a holdover complaint and get a judgment of possession and execute a warrant of removal. Um, given the current state of affairs in New Jersey, um, I think it's likely you will not have possession of that property, of that unit, until sometime in the fall, 
uh, given the current backlog and the, the current uh, uh, moratorium. So uh, that's how you would proceed with it. You want to serve that notice sooner than later on the uh, unit that you want to uh, occupy. Uh, and the other thing is, if you seek to personally occupy that unit, um, it, you, you're going to have to occupy it. You could be subject to certain penalties uh, for wrongful eviction, certain liability under wrongful eviction. You also can't occupy two homes at once. So, you know, if you have another home that you live in and that's your, your main residence, and this case is defended, that would be a that would be a, a meritorious defense to this cause of action. And if you have a home that you live in currently with your family and you're just using subsection L to take back this unit because you uh, you don't like this resident. Um, so you have to have a, a real intent to uh, live into the property and then serve this uh, two calendar month notice under subsection L. Okay. Um, are you aware of any protections for commercial tenants under the CARES Act and the executive orders? No. Okay. Um, one more on rent increases. A tenant's lease renews on August 1st. The new lease goes out to the tenant on June 1st. Can a landlord impose a rent increase for August 1st if the property has no mortgage? Looks like Bruce might have uh, been frozen. You back? <laughs> yeah, the overseas internet connections are not I know. <laughs> For anyone that hasn't noticed yet, Bruce is wearing his uh, his Florida shirt because he's down in Florida. There you go. We've gotten a lot of comments on that shirt. That's right. Hey, some of us have to work, Bruce. It's all right. Uh, yeah, I didn't pack accordingly for preparation of this meeting. <laughs> and, uh, I have to go shopping today because I'm pre presenting a meeting for the State Bar Association tomorrow, so I better get another outfit. <laughs> this shirt's fine. Just put a tie on. <laughs> There's no ties in Florida, but uh, actually just revisiting the question of the investor or the buyer of that two family house, since he hasn't actually purchased it yet, there is another basis or grounds to proceed. The seller of the house can actually serve the tenants with a notice terminating their tenancies if the buyer seeks to personally occupy the premises for residential purposes. Uh, the caveat for that is that contract of sale has to call for the unit to be vacant as a condition of closing because the buyer seeks to personally occupy it. So that's another way the purchaser can proceed is to have the seller actually terminate the leases of the existing tenants. And that's also subject to the fact that the leases cannot be terminated during the term. So if it's a 12-month lease, you have to wait until the expiration of the lease before the termination could be effective. It's just another okay. consideration, another way to possibly proceed for this future homeowner. One more on rent increases. If a tenant's lease renews on August 1st, the new lease goes out on June 1st. Can the landlord impose a rent increase effective August 1st if a property has no current mortgage? Yeah, that sounds correct. Okay. How about a sales contract? Can you terminate a sales contract based on a seller's inability to get a CFO right now? And they're that unable be, to close like that. That would be subject to the terms of the contract of sale. So there should be some conditions contained within the contract that give the buyer an escape clause if they're unable to meet certain conditions. Ordinarily, there's a contingency like a mortgage contingency. If a buyer can't get a mortgage, the seller can't force the buyer to close. So if obtaining municipal approvals was one of the contingencies in the contract, the, buyer can't, or the seller cannot obtain the municipal approval or the municipal approval can't be obtained by either party for whatever reason, that might be a contingency in the contract. So the attorney who's representing the purchaser would have to just look at the contract in that case. Okay, looks like we have one last question. If a tenant isn't paying their parking and their security deposit doesn't cover the balance, can the landlord tow that car? That would not be advisable under the current circumstances or really any circumstances. Uh, but different municipalities have different parking rules. If it is a 
if it is a resident vehicle and we know that it's a resident vehicle and it's unauthorized, we may be able to get the police to issue a uh, summons to the vehicle owner for parking on private property without permission. And if after the vehicle is ticketed, in those cases, it may be able to be towed. But we just would not recommend simply towing a vehicle uh, of a resident without it having first been issued as signed by the uh, police. From uh, I, I may take a little bit different take on that, uh, maybe a little bit more aggressive take on that. Um, you know, New Jersey has a towing statute. So as long as you have the proper signage for a private property, such as a multifamily property, um, you have the proper signage up and you have a, a parking agreement with this resident that talks about the payment of the parking fee. Um, you know, if, if they're not paying the fee or if they're illegally parked at the property, not parking in the right space, parking in a fire lane, and you have the proper signage up, I, I would take the position that, that you can you can tow the car. Or have the car towed by the towing company that you contacted with. Uh, all that information has to be posted in, in accordance with the towing statute at the property. Let's see. If you have language in your lease that states a lease can be terminated if a tenant has to relocate because of their job, does the tenant have the right to get out of their lease if their job has given them the ability to work remote until 2021? I think we'd have to take a look at the language in the lease, but I'm not sure why a landlord would offer that language to a tenant unless they intended to have it enforced in good faith. You know, there's always a good faith and fair dealing standard that's imposed upon every contract. So if a landlord put that clause in the lease and then the tenant sought to exercise that option because they needed to relocate for work purposes, sounds like the landlord would probably be held to have to uh, allow the tenant to, to uh, terminate that tenancy prematurely. Okay. Take that language out well, of the lease, take, unless it was negotiated. <laughs> take the language out of the lease. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to thank both of you for being here with us today and giving us your time and your expertise. This has really been great. Thank you for everybody that attended today. Um, and this will be available on our Facebook site. I see some questions came up that we had answered previously regarding the, cur the court situation, renter's assistance. You guys can replay this at any time. It'll be available on our site. You can also forward it to other people that may also use the information. We appreciate it. Be safe and be well. Thanks, Thank Kelly. You Thanks, Kelly. DOA. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you.